It gives me great pleasure to introduce Matthew Delegate. I met Matthew in 2008, I believe, um, on the campus of Williams College, if I recall correctly, when I was attending the Creative Capital Retreat, as was Matthew, and Matthew was leading professional development workshops in which I participated. Um, Matthew is an artist, a curator, a writer, and an arts worker. In his visual work, work his art practice, he merges painting with conceptual process and installation strategies. His work has been exhibited here in the United States at PS1, at the Bronx Museum of the Arts, the Herbert F. Johnson Museum in Ithaca, the Bass Museum of Art in Miami Beach, Indianapolis Museum of Contemporary Art, and uh, internationally at uh, too many venues to count, but in Germany, Switzerland, Italy, Austria, the Netherlands, France, Argentina, Argentina a number of exhibitions in Australia, I don't know how you manage that, um, and New Zealand. He participated in the 2014 Whitney Biennial. In 2003, Matthew and his wife and fellow artist Rosanna Martinez co-founded the Brooklyn-based gallery Minus Space, which was preceded by a website of the same name, um, which specializes in contemporary reductive abstract art and represents emerging and established artists in the field. Since 2006, he's organized over 60 solo and group exhibitions, both at Minus Space and at national and international venues. Matthew is a member of American Abstract Artists, and he serves on the board of the Elizabeth Foundation for the Arts um, on 39th Street, uh, and also on the Marie, Sharp Wal Marie Walsh Sharp Art Foundation's Artist Advisory Committee. He's received numerous awards and honors from, among others, Q Art Foundation, Brooklyn Arts Council, American Academy of Arts and Letters, and the Golden Rule Foundation. He's represented by Alejandra von Hartz Gallery in Miami, Peter Black Gallery in Laguna Beach, California, Gallery Sonia Roche in Houston, and Dr. Julius AP in Berlin. Matthew received an MFA in painting and a Master's of Science in Theory, Criticism, and History of Art, Design, and Architecture from Pratt, and a BA in Art and German from Wabash College in Crawfordsville, Indiana. And I'm very happy to uh, report that he recently joined the faculty in the MFA Fine Arts Department here at SVA. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Matthew Delegate. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. Thank you for coming. Um, that was a very long bio. Thank you for whoever wrote that. That was super nice. Somewhat exaggerated, but nice nevertheless. Um, my name is Matthew. Um, I am an artist, um, just like all of you, um, exactly doing the same thing that you guys are doing. Uh, I put this up here just to give you a sense of like how old I am, because I think a lot of people think that maybe I'm younger than yeah. I look. Yeah, I'll take that as a compliment. Thank you. I'm 43, so uh, I would describe myself as an emerging artist still. I know these terms are malleable. Emerging, maybe emerged. I don't really feel like I'm established as much as that resume might say. I feel like this is a work in progress and probably always will be. Um, for further information, uh, here's my site. But I'm going to be talking tonight about um, essentially two sort of key aspects to me. And I'm hoping that you guys will ask me as many questions as humanly possible. Um, I will leave time at the end for Q&A. Uh, but I'm going to talk about um, my studio work. And it's like such an honor, honestly. It feels I feel almost guilty talking about my work. I think as artists, we're often spoken for. We rarely have a chance to speak for ourselves. So I feel like having the opportunity to speak to you guys um, and having this kind of intro as a kind of a, an emerging faculty person here, I think is pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, the other thing I want to talk about, uh, if, probably for the second half of my talk, is about uh, the project that Mark mentioned, which is Minus Space, which um, was an online project that kind of became a project space, which is now a gallery, a uh, commercial gallery in uh, Brooklyn. So I'm going to talk about those two things. Um, but this is really how I see myself. I wear a lot of different hats. I'm sure this resonates with some of you in here. And how many of you guys are students? Can I just see a show of hands? 
Okay, we're all students, mostly. Cool. And how many of you guys are faculty here? Oh, we're all students. Awesome. Staff? Any staff? Okay, good. So this is going to be very much um, then geared towards you guys. So these are the kind of the hats that I wear. Um, these are a lot, clearly. I mean, I first and foremost see myself as an artist. Uh, I'm an artist in everything I do, everything I approach, everything I work on. I approach it as a working artist, as a working artist, kind of with my sleeves rolled up. You know, this is like in the trenches. Uh, I'm also um, a default curator. I am a default gallerist. Um, I do a lot of writing now. Uh, I'm a teacher, so I've had the great fortune now of joining you guys here at SVA. Uh, I've also done a lot of teaching with Creative Capital, which is a nas uh, national nonprofit service organization here in New York City. Um, I am an arts worker. I've worked at a bunch of different nonprofits. I worked at the New York Foundation for the Arts for about a dozen years. I volunteered widely across boards and other, other areas. Um, uh, I do a lot of consulting. I get my brain picked a lot, um, which is kind of nice by nonprofits that want to do this or magazines that want to fundraise for that and this kind of a thing. Um, board membership I mentioned. Um, critical to my practice too is that I'm a parent. I have a first grader named Mateo. I'm going to talk about him actually in this lecture. I hope you guys don't mind. Indulge me. Uh, and then I'm also a husband. Uh, and these things are kind of all integrated into the same big picture project. Um, I think the art world is really built for kind of 23-year-old people, right? That kind of graduate, you're emerging, you kind of like can live hand to mouth, you crash on couches, you get your work out there, and you have no other obligations outside of that. Um, that's not the art world that I exist in, nor most of the people that I know. So um, I sort of think of it holistically. So this is kind of what I look like. Um, I did my graduate work at Pratt. Uh, I did my undergraduate work at a really teeny tiny liberal arts school in a cornfield in Indiana called Wabash College. It was smaller than my high school. I grew up outside of Chicago and the entire college had 18, 800 students and it was all male. I will stress that. It was like the Lord of the Flies. It was like really at each other's throats constantly. Um, I went immediately from my undergraduate to my graduate school, uh, and I went to graduate school at Pratt. And while I was there, I did uh, two degrees, which was unusual. Um, and I actually have a colleague here, Pat Zarate, in the second row, who knows me from there, going 20, 20 years back. Um, but I did two degrees. I did one in painting, and I did a second in art history. And I did them at the same time. And I did that deliberate, deliberately. Uh, I, as a producer, as an artist, you know, we really need to know what preceded us in order to contribute anything to that discourse. So doing an art history degree um, was very natural. You know, everything that I researched in art history, which was mainly focusing on um, modern art, contemporary art, non-Western art, was related to exactly what I was working on in the studio at the moment. In fact, I wrote my graduate art history thesis on the painter Alfred Jensen. You guys know his work? Show of hands, anybody? Couple of you, yep, still anomalous, right? Still a kind of an exception. He's represented by Pace. He died in the early 80s. Um, kind of interesting diagram, conceptual painter. Uh, very much related to the work that I'm interested in, which is kind of conceptual abstraction. Um, uh, I also did a, a degree in painting. Uh, Pratt was really interesting at that time um, in that it was really disorganized. And that does well for a lot of people, like myself. Not so well for other people. But um, I didn't make a painting the whole time I was in Pratt. So you know, I studied there for three years, focused mainly on installation, drawing, conceptual work, and finished with a, a painting degree. But I really see the sort of the work that I'm interested in primarily in the work I do in the studio as, as related to painting, or the history of painting, or the discourse around painting, the problems with painting. Um, so uh, I graduated from Pratt in 1997, and I've been kind of a emerging artist ever since. I'm sort of edging up near 20 years at this point. Yep. Uh, I'm going to show you just, uh, so indulge me, I'm going to show you some images of some stuff I've made as an artist. Um, it's not really organized in any particular way. I don't think of my work as kind of evolving linearly. You know, I don't go from like one thing into the next thing into the next thing into the next thing. I don't think of my work as a timeline, in other words. I kind of circle back on certain kind of key values or key ideas uh, that I'm interested in quite a bit. Uh, I'm interested in specifically abstraction, the history of abstraction. It's 100 years old. 
relative to the grand scheme of things in the art world, this is a drop of the bucket. I mean, this is 100 years out of a 30,000 year history. I was talking with Georgia earlier about this new grave that was found recently. It was in the Times Today in Pylos, Greece, that dated back to 1500 BC. I mean, this is, this is old, right? Um, 100 years is nothing, okay? So um, I kind of approach painting pluralistically. I'm interested in kind of everything at my disposal. A lot of painters, particularly in New York, um, with kind of the tradition that we have here, think of painting as kind of being this kind of monumental thing, capital P painting, right? You guys following me? Yep, okay, good. Um, that, uh, you know, once you pick up a brush in the studio, you've got this like gorilla on your back, the legend of like <laughs> Pollock and de Kooning and all this like history that goes all the way back for 100 years. Um, I recognize that, I don't buy into it. Um, so my painting practice is not really so much involved in kind of moving paint around a surface, trying to find things um, in a way that kind of designates a certain kind of a signature, if you want to describe it as that. So I'm making a painting gesture. This is my generic painting gesture. I'm making paintings, right? Uh, I'm much more interested in kind of strategies and I kind of work strategy by strategy and I'm in the great fortunate position right now of, of being invited to do shows. So I get to show my work quite a bit. And I tend to make work specifically for shows, meaning specifically for a context, specifically for a venue, specifically for a curatorial idea. And um, I tend to make work in that direction. I don't tend to sit in my studio and kind of make work and push stuff around. I don't really think of myself um, as going to the studio to kind of find myself or to find things to talk about. I tend to sort of think constantly. I'm involved in a lot of different things and I tend to make stuff in the studio when I have something to say. I don't really go there to find something to say. Okay, so this is a little unusual for a painter who, you know, most of you guys at this point are trying to figure out your lives. You want to kind of reduce all the things you have to do in order to do the things you want to do. Yes? I think this is most painters want to spend as much time painting as humanly possible. Again, speaking for the painters. Uh, that's not necessarily my thing. I tend to work when I feel like I have something to say. And it may be um, a lot at one point, and it may be very little. So I tend to work strat sort of strategically, like strategy to strategy. So this is a view of a show I did last year in Bushwick at a space called Outlet of um, some broken panel paintings. I've developed this very unhealthy relationship with monochrome painting lately, maybe over the last 10 years, monochrome being you know, kind of the end game of where painting can go. It's one color, one surface, devoid of anything outside of itself, thinking specifically of like the radical painting group that emerged during the 1970s um, here in New York City. Some people involved in that were like Merrill Wagner or Joe Marioni or, or others. Do these names ring a bell? Or am I speaking like baseball here? Okay, cool. Okay, so. Suffice it to say, monochrome painting's got a long tradition as well. Um, so uh, these are two paintings. This is a third one. Uh, the work that I do tends to come out of the real world or references things outside of itself. These are not holed up in ivory towers, uh, but these are things that reference like the United States involvement in the Middle East over the last 12 years, which has been the lion's share of my life. This was a show called False Positive. Um, this is a painting called Third World Democracy. Uh, so these are paintings that are made, um, in some cases, really meticulously, as old school as I can possibly get. Um, in the case of this painting, this is done with spray paint, which I feel is a non-painting method. I feel like it's got ties to the street. It's not really ties to Jackson Pollock, right? Um, so these are done with spray paint, and then they're demolished with a hammer. So these are sort of one step and then a second step. Uh, and this is sort of a generic, kind of color palette of every single country in the Middle East and how you know things develop in a very kind of utopian way and then they completely demolish like they've been imploded from the inside, like through a bombing, okay? You guys following me, right? So uh, that was the conceit of one show. Um, this is another strategy. Uh, this is a show I did last year um, with a gallery I work with in LA uh, called Vanitas. And these were, uh, again, monochrome paintings where I framed, um, totally plain, off-the-shelf stretchers into extremely elaborate Rococo Baroque frames, um, and then sprayed them all at once. So again, these are spray painted, but spray painted with the frame and the image into one thing. So fusing image and presentation of image into one event. 
Um, and there were about 10 paintings in the show. They're all about the size of this. They reference clearly, again, art historical reference being 17th century Dutch still life painting, Vanitas paintings. And these are, in my opinion, kind of quasi-minimalist. There are a couple of objects, a skull, a burnt candle, an oyster shell, or something that's been half eaten on a plate with a very kind of spare and theatrical background. But they're allegorical in that they represent things and how fleeting life is. And I feel like these works are really tied into kind of the art market in a weird way. Uh, as someone that runs a space, I'm very clear about the theater of presenting work and what that means. Not just presenting work, not visiting studios, not writing about artwork, but presenting those ideas publicly and how that gets consumed by an audience. Um, primarily collectors and how overheated the art market is. So these were sort of things that were kind of running through my head. Um, the palette of the show was red, yellow, and blue, which are pretty classic sort of distill colors, primary colors, as well as a couple of neutral values, gray, and a couple of metallics as well, which I felt were over the top, like this. So this is a bright gold painting where um, you know, the, again, the image and the presentation of that image have been fused into one experience. Cool? Again, kind of the opposite of what a monochrome painter uh, may do or should do. Uh, here's another one called Sun Yellow, and these are just names of the, of the Krylon paint, honestly, that these, paint, these colors came from. So again, super hyper-amped visual experiences. Um, here is an installation shot of a show I did in Miami with a gallery that I worked with there, Alejandro von Hartz, a couple of years ago. Uh, and you'll see here that there is a wall of black, uh, which is garbage bags. I think of that as a painting. Uh, again, I often paint with acrylic paint. Acrylic paint is, in essence, pigment in plastic. It's pigment in a polymer. So thinking about painting and thinking about kind of the vocabulary of painting that I'm interested in, monochrome painting, grid painting, Pattern painting, geometric painting, you know, when you pull bags out of boxes to put your garbage in them, they have all of those qualities already built into them. So this idea of kind of a finding a painting or using a ready-made or a stand-in for a painting is interesting to me. So this is a wall on three sides of a space called Blackout. And then there are works that are hung on top of that wall. So hanging my own work on top of my own work, I find is a provocation. Okay. Uh, here's another view of that show. It's not everything in that show, but an, another sample of it. So here, in this case, I wanted to organize the show around the colors black, white, uh, gray, and gold. Um, and the show's title was Ceremony. And again, this referencing kind of the notion of an exhibition being a kind of ceremony, right? So that's what an exhibition is. It's kind of the, the end of a certain kind of time period or an effort that is celebrated. Um, and in this case, it's referring specifically to a song by the band New Order, um, which is also called Ceremony, which is, um, again, for me, this is a piece called Unknown Knowns, um, but it's a stand-in. So this is a t-shirt, my t-shirt, of a uh, cover of the Joy Division. Do you guys know this album? Is this ancient history? All of a sudden, this looks really old, right? OK, sorry. Um, Joy Division, Unknown Pleasures, Rock Band, this is their first recording ceremony after uh, they uh, sort of ended Joy Division. They sort of regrouped and became New Order. And I feel like this kind of liminal spot between the formation of one thing and the formation of another thing is where we are right now in the art world, particularly with abstraction. Like, there's existing abstraction, there's a lot of new abstraction that keeps being dubbed zombie. Uh, which I hate. I absolutely hate this term because it's not. It's anything but, actually. And I feel like that sort of liminal state between one band collapsing and another band forming is where painting is right now. This is a band that was important to me when I was growing up. So um, again, using a stand-in, using a shirt that I've worn for forever, and turning that into a painting with a depiction of someone else's image on it that I had nothing to do as sort of a precedent of what I'm doing now. Again, Peter Seville co-opted a lot of other artists' work into his own design work, who's the guy that designed this cover. Um, this is a sculpture. I think of it as a painting, though. It's a piece called 1%. Um, it is a pyramid of bricks that I scavenged on my street in downtown Brooklyn. I live on Pacific Street. Um, 
Pacific Street Lab like a month or two ago was named the Gold Coast of Brooklyn, which is like maddening to me because um, we bought an apartment that we could afford on the worst place on earth at the time. And now it has become kind of fool's gold. Um, so these are bricks that I've scavenged from buildings that are being torn down on my block and spray painted them gold and stacked them into a big power, sort of a big power structure uh, and named it the 1%. So this is really sort of a stand-in for fool's gold. It's meant to evoke Carl Andre's work. It's meant to evoke Egyptian pyramids or Mexican ziggurats. And it's meant to be really lame and low-tech, OK? And it sits on the floor. Uh, you guys follow me? OK, I'm throwing a lot of ideas out. I just want to make sure you guys are OK. Um, this is a show I did uh, two, three years ago, a show called Pictures at an Exhibition. Uh, again, titling, you'll note, is really important to me. I feel like a lot of abstract work is called Untitled or Untitled 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, which is fine, but it's not like where I'm at. I want my work to refer to things outside of itself and be sourced from that. Um, and a lot of that source is actually reading like the New York Times. I'm not reading like, I know maybe a lot of you guys read fiction or read poetry or biographies, but I can't get like enough of the news lately. The news is like, I don't know, it seems to be more potent than anything I can read in, in fiction these days. So this is a show called Pictures at an, at an Exhibition. Um, I wanted to do a show uh, that was uh, a presentation of works where each of them was mutually exclusive of the others. As artists, we tend to want to show like a new series of paintings. Here's my new six paintings, here's my new six photographs. They all relate to one another. I wanted this to look like I organized a group show of my own work, okay? Uh, which is tough to make it where it's actually coherent. So pictures of an exhibition comes from an album that came out 150 years ago um, by Mussorgsky and Ravel. Um, it's about someone writing. You guys know this, maybe, classical music people. Um, Russian, it's about uh, an art critic that goes to an exhibition of his friend who died in the retrospective, and he um, composes um, a piece of music uh, about the visual experience of seeing his friend's work, who just died. Uh, and thinking about pictures at an exhibition being very sort of self-referential. So here on the back wall, there is a piece with projected light. So these are um, floodlights, colored floodlights that are projecting onto blank canvases that are bleeding out and over into one another. There is another black plastic bag piece. Instead of this time being an environment, this functions as a very large monochromatic piece. It's a piece called Nuclear Error. There's a book piece on the ground, which I'll talk about a little bit more, called Zero Sum. I'll talk about that in just a second. Uh, and then there's another piece that's up on the sh pedestal, which I'll talk about in just a second as well. It's a piece called Color Vulture. So a piece asking really the question about where painting happens and if it's even necessary to paint these things anymore. So uh, again, projected light. Uh, red, yellow, and blue being a given. These are not things that I created. I like finding things. I like being sort of, uh, sort of handed things uh, by precedent, by other artists, and then manipulate, manipulating them. So again, three monochrome paintings. Uh, again, nuclear error. Uh, this piece was about 14 feet tall. And again, it's a gridded, black, beautiful, sexy, super seductive, in-person looking kind of a monochrome. Uh, and these works are actually held to the, gather, held to the wall with static, static electricity. So there's this idea that you've got this painting that is literally charged with power that is then kind of adhered to the wall. OK, cool. There's another painting in here. It's a piece called Soft Edge. Uh, this is blue painter's tape over a panel. There's actually 10 rolls of blue painter's tape over a panel where I took a very, very hard surface and through applying layer after layer after layer of blue tape. Uh, made a soft, squishy, malleable painting. And the title of this refers to an artist named Carl Benjamin, who I had met right before this. Um, has anyone heard of, you, have you guys heard of like hard edge painting? Does this term, yep, so it's like geometric painting. So hard edge was originally codified to describe Carl Benjamin's work in the 1950s. He's an LA based color painter. Uh, and I had a chance to meet him actually right before I made this piece. And he had always been describing his problem with this term of hard edge. He's like, so as opposed to what, soft edge? You know, like, what does this mean exactly? It doesn't make any sense. Um, so this was a homage to him because he had died just a couple of weeks prior to that. Uh, this is a piece called Threesome. Again, looking at 
the way, yes, you're supposed to laugh, good. <laughs> no one laughs at this piece usually, good. Uh, the collector that bought this actually had no idea what I was talking about, which was kind of amazing. <laughs> Uh, so these are, again, sort of givens. Uh, rollers are given. The format is given. Um, and I was thinking, well, like, what can you do? Like, has everything been done that you could possibly do with these three colors? So I kind of thought of them as being kind of like they're dipped into paint and pulled out. Um, but I'm really kind of thinking of them as kind of being like half-dressed. Like they've been around for a long time. They're trying to mix it up a little bit, trying to find something new. So yes, sculptural painting piece. Um, moving on, uh, this is going to seem like a lot of noise. I've been making a lot of color painting as well. Um, these are six different paintings that are painted at random. So looking at color painting, looking at monochrome painting, looking at pattern painting, and thinking about like, ways of contributing to that discourse. Uh, these are six different pieces. They're all on a four by four grid, right? which is kind of like a basic structure to allow colors to interact with each other. Um, Obviously, color needs a structure in order to exist. In this case, it's a grid of squares. Uh, the colors are chosen at random. And what I mean by that is, in order to do this project um, in a real way, I had to go out and buy a library of color. Um, so I went out and uh, bought every single color that Golden Paints makes, because that's just what needed to happen, which was very expensive and costly to do. Uh, and then I painted an index card with each of those colors, turned them over, shuffled them up, and pulled four cards. And then made a painting with them, no matter what the cards were. Okay? Uh, no matter what they looked like. Um, and in some cases, I really liked what they looked like, and in some cases, I did not. And I presented both of those, the ones that I did and did not like, in exhibitions. So again, thinking about um, intentionality and presentation of work, uh, thinking about you know presenting things on the wall that represent me, but not in the way that you would think would represent me, like presenting work that I think is god awful, honestly. Um, so uh, this was a project that I started around 2005, a kind of a strategy of mixing colors. It developed kind of sequentially from left to right over time. So I thought, OK, so why don't I make one of these shuffle paintings? And why don't I make a shuffle painting of that painting within itself? So again, thinking of like the stuff that I did where I hung work of my own work on top of my work. Uh, what happens if I make a painting of a painting within itself? Or what happens on the far right if I make a painting of the painting within itself, but I reverse the color locations? Or what if I make a painting where there's a both a, a, a smaller version of itself within itself and then an inversion of that? Or what if I make a painting with a painting that's not in, in it, right? So I hung these two paintings side by side to each other, where one painting is literally pointing at the other painting, right? And then making paintings that, that, that you know, are unrelated to anything. So again, just asking questions constantly. And again, you'll see through all of these things that the work is about ideas, first and foremost, and then worrying about how to execute or act on those ideas. Uh, a lot of times I'll present this work on walls that are painted randomly as well. So I will pull those same cards and paint a wall pink or paint a wall yellow if that's the cards that get pulled out. Uh, this is a project I did for the Bass Museum involving that same exact thing a couple of years ago in Miami, if any of you guys have been down there. Uh, this is a show I did in Berlin um, about a year ago, where I took those shuffle paintings and tried to squish them down into like the most compact, condensed little thing I could possibly make them. So trying to see if color interaction can happen not on a large scale, which I think most of us are accustomed to, but on like these paintings are eight inches. They're this big, OK? And putting them in a space where there's a lot of room around them. So they kind of float. Cool. Um, moving on, Whitney Biennial, um, yes, this happened last year. How it happened, I have no idea, honestly. You guys can pick my brain at length about this. So this is a very mysterious, opaque process. Um, it happens. I happen to be in it. This was no intentionality on my part whatsoever. Uh, you know, this is the kind of thing that happens, you know, when you're in school, and I know you guys are all in school right now, where you're like, oh my god, I could totally do this, I dream of this, I want to be in this thing, it is something that, you know, I want to have in my career eventually. And I left school in 1997 with that same kind of thing, thinking this is awesome, and I went to every biennial and think, well, this work is, you know, doable, I could be here, you know, if it's just the right person meeting the curator or somehow penetrating 
through like a Trojan horse method into the museum, this would happen. And you know, after 10 years of kind of thinking about it, you kind of, you just kind of let go. You know, the art world you occupy is much smaller than you think it's gonna be. It tends to be kind of tribal, right? So I have my tribe, some of my tribe is like in second row here, right? In the third <laughs> row, like my people, you know, this is my cohort, um, and I'm totally comfortable there. Um, it's not 100% of the art world or 100% of the general public. It is a sub-niche within a sub-niche of the visual art world. And New York is huge that way, so you guys are all gonna be occupying niches within niches, right? And within that niche, um, and the work I did through the gallery, it landed me here through a backdoor, totally unanticipated way. Um, so uh, the piece that I worked, so the um, biennial happened last year. I was invited to participate in it with, uh, by Michelle Grabner. Any of you guys know her? Has she been here? No? Okay. She should be here. And actually, maybe I'll bring her here next year in the spring. Uh, she's awesome. She's an artist, just like you, just like me. Um, and she uh, is got her hands in a lot of different things. And she, oh, I mean, I'll tell you the story. I mean, she's been visited to be in the biennial five or six times. Was never in the biennial as an artist was later tapped to curate the biennial, okay? So I don't know what that means, but think about that for a while. Um, but she went and her, you know, the, the biennial this year was very much uh, three kind of fiefdoms, like a layer cake, there's a lot of descriptors of it. I was part of her layer cake, and her layer cake was about finding artists that could act, and it's very flattering, but act as sort of as, as examples for other artists to kind of follow or mimic or undermine or function in some sort of she describes it as a curriculum, okay? And I guess I fit that role, so she invited me to participate. So I worked with her on this project. Um, she's the kind of person that trusts the cook, meaning when she invites artists to participate in things, she's not micromanaging them, like, what are you gonna do? How big is it? What size is it? She's like, you just go do your thing. So the first time Michelle actually saw this work was at the Whitney, at the opening. Uh, that's the kind of curator she is, and I can't say enough good things about her. So this is a project called Zero Sum. I've done this project probably a dozen different ways over the last 10 years. You saw one version of some books on a plinth in that show I showed it in Tennessee, right? This um, is a installation, it's a vitrine of 42 discounted and discarded art books that I have acquired over time. I found them in museum discount bins and secondhand bookstores. I've literally pulled them out of the garbage in some cases, like out of a dumpster. Um, I have found one of them, that little book Circle, as a door prop at an art school, like literally used, being used as a doorstop, okay? Now these are all books that are part of my library. These are part of my kind of thinking about art history as applied research. Uh, these are the things that I didn't learn in school, uh, that I'm kind of self-taught myself in a way. And um, I always found it problematic when I'd find these books Discounted, I feel like I'm in like a rescue operation. So I go to a museum, I'm looking through the live, you know, bookstore, and then there's always like the stuff that's in the discount bin which nobody wants. And it's always, always the stuff that I'm interested in. Always. So I've been collecting that stuff and it got to the point where oh, I'm just gonna buy this copy of this book, and then you know, a couple of years later we're like, what the hell is this doing here? Why is this book here? I don't understand what's so I started questioning why those books are there. Because this is again part of my tribe, part of my genealogy, if you want to describe it, and why is my genealogy, why is my tribe being discounted, discarded, and thrown out? Um, so this became kind of an advocacy project. So I'd find a book, and I'd actually, if there were five copies, I'd buy all five. And you'll see what that relates to in just a moment. So some of the books, um, so this is a timeline. It's a specific installation uh, for the Whitney, for the Biennial. There are 42 books that are organized more or less chronologically from uh, tracing early modernism in New York and in the United States through the development of abstraction, geometric abstraction, abstract expressionism, minimalism, and all the way down the line to today. So think of this as a timeline. Think of it um, as a, having a middle point. The navel of this project um, was where it started to go from applied research into being very personal for me. Um, meaning that all the artists that are on the second half of this timeline I know or have been to their studios or have presented their work in my gallery. So this is not just sort of some abstract kind of navel-gazing kind of a project. Um, so some of the books that are here include um, The Whitney, 
that was actually the first book. This is a book I bought at the Whitney that was discounted by the Whitney. It's a book about the Whitney's own collection. And I literally bought it 10 feet from where my vitrine was installed. I took it home 10 years ago and I brought it right back. Okay, so which I find, again, provocative. Um, and returning it not as a book, but returning it as an art object. Okay. Um, the book that ended that vitrine is a book uh, that I found discounted here. It's a book about the suburban, the early years. Uh, the suburban is the space that Michelle Grabner founded in Chicago. Okay, so this was something that I found in a bookstore here that, again, was discarded. Okay, so again, bookending. Whitney and the curator, the reason I'm actually sitting in the Whitney. Um, thinking about books as being kind of performances in a way, like I have to find these things, I can't just like buy them. Or maybe they find me, excuse me. Um, but uh, thinking of them as ready-mades in the lineage of like Duchamp and how Duchamp has influenced my work. Many other people as well, like John Cage and others. Uh, I thought this was classic, though, 50% off a Duchamp book. I mean, you couldn't get better than this. Left the, I left the sort of discount stickers on these. This is a book I bought up at um, the Clark Institute. On the right side uh, is the Gallery of Living Art, which was um, the first space for modern art in New York City. Has anyone heard of this space? Okay, it's a space run, organized by A.E. Gallatin, founded in 1928, right on Washington Square Park. A.E. Gallatin was an artist, part of the Park Avenue Cubists, abstract painter. He was also very wealthy. He spent his money buying modern art. Picasso, Leger, Braque, and decided, well, wouldn't it be interesting to open up a space for Americans to see avant-garde, as the way he described it, art in New York City. So 1928, he opened up a space that existed through about 1943 on Washington Square Park. Okay, so this is an artist who is taking matters into their own hands. Okay, this is an example for me. So this thing was called the Gallery of Living Art, and this is a book that came out in like 1933 of the collection, right? Um, funny story, he wanted to donate, when he was closing down, he wanted to donate his collection to the Metropolitan Museum. I mean, like an unbelievable collection of modern art, and they were like, no way. We don't want this stuff, you can have it. And he ended up uh, donating, it, donating it to the uh, Philadelphia Museum of Art. So the Philadelphia Museum of Art's collection, all that amazing work that you've seen is his collection. So just keep that in mind, uh, how things can change, tastes can change. Um, a couple of catalogs here. Art of the Real was a show at MoMA in 1968. Uh, this is sort of on the more personal side. This is uh, an exhibition that kind of talked about a lot of different things, but really kind of codified minimalism, color field painting, hard edge painting. This is a book that includes two of the artists that I work with at the gallery right now, Robert Swain and Sandy, Sandy Wormfeld. At the time, they were the two youngest artists in the show in their early 20s, early to mid 20s. On the right, a wall painting catalog from the 70s. Um, and I've shown Marsha Hafif's work, Lucio Pozzi's work, Bob Yasuda's work, and not Robert Ryman's, but I've shown Meryl Wagner's work at the, at the gallery. So these are things that are no longer kind of applied research. Um, two more books I'll show you before moving on. Joe Marioni, anyone know his work? He was someone I mentioned earlier uh, related to the Radical Painting Group, 1970s. This is a monograph of his work. He was in the 2000 Whitney Biennial. Okay, so this is someone that I'm putting back into my work who's already been in this biennial once. This was a book that was stocked by the Whitney during the Whitney Biennial that they then later got rid of in their discount bin, which again, I find really interesting. You don't notice these patterns, but through my own weird filter lens, I do. Uh, David Diao was in the Whitney Biennial with me this year. Uh, and David was really thrilled to be part of my piece because his body of work is exclusively about other artists and about measuring his own career achievements. Okay, so I don't know if you know his work as well. Do you? Yes? He's someone that I think should be so much more well known. Go out and buy Bomb Magazine. This fall issue, I interviewed him for that. This is the most exhaustive interview that he's done, so you'll learn a ton. He's awesome. Okay? Uh, so David Yao. Um, so moving on, uh, this is a show I've got up right now at um, Southern Oregon University, the Schneider Museum of Art. This is actually a two-person show that I'm doing with my wife, uh, Rosanna Martinez, and she's going to make an entree shortly uh, into my talk. But uh, she did the pieces that are on the chairs, that are books balanced between two chairs that are meant to be picked up and discussed between two people. 
So it's a performative piece. And then I did the wall shelves. Um, and these are, again, iterations, curatorial iterations of um, zero sum. So this is from a show we called uh, With You in Constant Conversation. I met my wife at Pratt in 1994. She lived next door to me. So like you guys are in grad school, this is where I met her. And we have been showing together in group shows and in two-person shows and sharing the same studio for 20 years. Okay, so this is a, the latest of that. And again, it's about conversing between the two of us and conversing with you in constant conversation. So these are, um, I had four shelf pieces, they're new. Uh, this is one. Um, this is a shelf of private collections that have gone up to auction at auction houses. Okay, and why this, right? Um, as artists, um, you know, we work really, really hard, right? We make like unbelievable sacrifices to make our work. Financial sacrifices, sanity, family, all of those things. With the idea that it will hopefully find an audience. Whatever that audience is, maybe it's another group of artists. Maybe it's a writer. Maybe it's a curator. In this case, maybe it's a collector. And having run a space now for 12 years, I've gotten to know a lot of collectors and how they operate. So the idea is that we go into these collections and those collections are donated eventually to posterity. They end up in a museum. But in some cases, that's not what happens. They go back into this sort of digestive system in the art world through the auction houses and get spit right back out. Okay? So as artists, we produce. Collectors then sort of put a lens over that. They then end up getting assembled, and then they get redistributed through this big bang back out into the universe. So these are um, books of private collections that have gone up for auction, rather than ending up in institutions. Um, does that make sense? There's about 40 books on this shelf, mainly Americans, actually. Uh, this is another piece called Futurism. Um, I find this book everywhere. It's everywhere, nobody notices it for some reason. I must have 30 copies of this book. Uh, at this point, there are six in this version. Uh, looking at abstraction, looking at abstraction in greater context. You guys know about futurism, right? This is a movement that happened in Italy in the teens of the last century, like 100 years ago. A lot of those artists were um, sort of kind of rabid believers in the future, in mechanization, in the kind of the new order. And um, were very kind of optimistic in one way. Uh, they were also very politically aligned, very right, and ended up fighting in World War I. And many of them died, ending futurism. Okay, so again, looking at sort of the role of artwork, looking at the role of developments of ideas, looking at where those ideas go, and what may or may not exist. So again, sort of thinking future, thinking futurism um, for this piece. Does that make sense? Moving on. Any questions about that so far? You can hold them. I know I'm throwing like tons of info at you. Yeah, it's a good question. So my intention is about sort of the like relativity of like looking. Did everybody understand that? So the question was about what are my what were my intentions with that piece that dealt with the random color shuffle paintings, right? Did I, did I understand that correctly? So my intention there was to, on one hand, look at color painting and look at like what, what is still possible with it. Color painting, has, color painting has been around since the Romans, honestly, maybe since the ancient Greeks. Uh, notions of that has been written about certainly since then. Uh, it's something that I'm really deeply interested in and committed to. Uh, I feel like there is a lot of potential still with it, like to present color painting, color situations that are um, the opposite of intentional, in a way. So on one hand, it was sort of honoring and looking and looking at where there are opportunities to kind of expand on those ideas. And the other is really about audience. So every time I present these works, I mean, I'll give you an example. I had a show of these works. I showed you an image with a pink wall and a yellow wall at a commercial gallery, right, in Miami. And at the opening, I had um, some of the gallery's collectors come up to me. Great, you know, so you do. This is what you do. You talk about your work and represent it, right? And um, they asked me a really simple question, which I think summarizes this project. They asked me, you know, we're interested in acquiring one of these two paintings, right? It's between this one and this one. Which is your favorite? 
Okay? And then I'm like, well, do you know how I made these paintings? Right? And then after explaining how I made these paintings, they didn't buy either of them. Okay? <laughs> Which I think is really interesting. I mean, this is, these are works that are meant to be provocative. So what I think that happened was that it undermined what they think they knew when they looked at artwork. I think that was sort of in a way what was in my mind like trying to understand like why you needed to like buy all the paints rather than just going to choose like specific colors because it sort of has like financial implications I guess. I exactly and then you know f and, and, and again this is what works for me and these are the kind of questions I'm asking for my own practice but some of you may be interested in in how your work fits into the market and how you earn earn a living off of your work and you'll be asking different kinds of questions but what this says to me is that um, you know when you approach an artwork you approach it as being 100% intentional that this is 100% of the artist's intention like they're presenting me a form of truth right and I'm going to take it at that face value when I was presenting them a form of truth that they were not accustomed to. And that's okay. So I didn't sell the work. I still have it at the studio. So if you know of anybody. Uh, kidding. Um, did you have a question before I move on? Yeah. Did that answer that question though? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah so it's, it's not just, I mean for me it's not just like making work in the studio anymore. I mean to kind of blow this out a bit. Like, Making work in the studio, within the four walls of the studio, happens. But then I'm also interested in what happens when it leaves the studio. And that's become a bigger and bigger part of the, of the process and the thinking in the studio. Yeah. Um, I have two questions. Sure. Um, the first one is related to intentionality and presentation in your work with the spray paint, um, where it's called Third World Democracies. Um, the question that I have is, like, it's related to like clarity because, um, like, when I first saw the paintings, I didn't know that they were spray painted. But then, like you, the artist, explained to the viewer right. that it's like spray painted, and that, in a way, kind of made it more clear, in a way, and also more interesting. But like as a viewer, when I saw it, just the artwork by itself, um, I didn't know that it was spray painted. Mm -hmm. So there, there was this kind of like, like the artist's intervention in the work. Like, like this literal intervention that the viewer wouldn't be subjected to when he, would, like, he or she would like, just be looking at it without the artist being present. Right. Um, so there's a dichotomy that's mm -hmm. like, developing with modern art. So how would you address that? It's a really good question. So yes, yeah, so what you're seeing right now are, are, are documentation right, of works. They're not the actual works. Right? So that's, that's part of it. So I think it would be maybe more visible when you actually saw the works, how they were made. Again, as a practitioner, you would probably be all, you know, every artist I know that comes to the galleries has their nose up in our paintings like this. You know, they stick their face in it. Like, how do they do this, you know? So you would probably be able to tell as an artist, as a, as a maker, exactly how I did it. Uh, and again, making things in the most sort of direct and simple, straightforward way possible is really important to me. No tricks, no gimmicks, no novelty, none of that. Just making things very, very simple. Um, and the second part of your question is an interesting one. Um, what does an audience get out of the work when I'm not there to talk well, about it? Yet. Yeah, I'm sorry? I haven't asked it yet. Oh, OK. I was sort of a, a two-part question. But intentionality, I mean, the works have to stand for themselves. There are clues in terms of titling. Generally, I show when exhibitions that have been written about somehow with a curator, or there's a wall text, or there is at the very least maybe a press release or a checklist of like 42 discounted art books, which I think will lead you at least part of the way in, into that. Okay. My second question is about the art books. Um, that's quoting other people in your work. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to ask about quotations, because you have an art history major, like the role of quotations in artwork and art practice, because like it's related to appropriation in a way. Mm -hmm. So could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. I think the I think about appropriation quite a bit, and I think um, at this point in the development of the art world, anything is possible, and I think it's totally fair game to incorporate other artists' work into your work. You do it all the time anyway. You may sublimate things. You may do things consciously. I mean, we are constantly pirating, scavenging, 
subverting work of other people. Um, and there may be very direct quotations. And there may be very sort of subliminal quotations, but there's always quotations. And particularly if you are sort of pushing forward or trying to sort of advance a certain kind of discourse, you have to, again, to go back to what I said earlier, you have to know what preceded you. And in this case, many of the things are given. And I like the fact that I did not invent them, like red, yellow, and blue, like the grid, like checkers, like squares, these kinds of things. Um, and even things that I find, I didn't make them. But there is a moment where they are identified as being made or as identified as being a tool to be used. So it's all on the table. Which is, again, coming from a painting background, that's, it's problematic in a good way. The development of quotations is, again, with modern art. Or has it been happening in the past? Like, I no, I think quotation has been there all along. I mean, if you can think of like neoclassical painting, they're quoting, even like Renaissance painting, I mean, they're painting stuff that happened 1,500 years before that. Again, in a Western tradition. Uh, but I think quotation is, is part of it. I think. Should we move on? Yeah? You guys hanging in there with me? Chapter two. <laughs> OK. Um, mine is space. So um, the other hat that I'm going to present tonight is uh, a gallery. I use this word kind of loosely still. It is a gallery um, now. It was not founded as a gallery. Uh, I got out of graduate school in 2000, or excuse me, in 1997 and was like honestly very fortunate to have been kind of picked up into exhibiting very quickly. I was picked up by a gallery that existed at that time. I had a show at like the Bronx Museum. I got some press in the New York Times, which was really nice, all within a couple of years outside of graduate school. And, um, you know, after, and again, my wife, I'm sort of, this is sort of me and my wife, I should say in this case. You know, after about five years of that, like from about 2000, 1997 to about 2002, after kind of five years of showing and some good stuff and some bad stuff and some bigger shows and some smaller group shows and some stuff that was well curated and some stuff that was less so, um, it became really clear to me that, you know, if this is what things look like five years out, like, what is the next five years going to look like? And what is the 10 years going to look like out after that or 15 years out? And I started asking myself, you know, is this, the, is this, is this it? I mean, is this what being an artist is? Is it like working a job in order to spend time in your studio to kind of get your stuff out there and have it kind of partially represented or maybe partially misunderstood? And I became, we became increasingly frustrated with that. Um, you guys are ensconced in school right now. You've got a community. I mean, literally on the left side of you and on the right side of you, you're sitting within your group. You've got like awesome conversations. There's parties being planned after Halloween. I mean, this is like amazing. When you leave here, and many of you have already been out of school between undergraduate and graduate, that's not the case. So that sense of like meaning, kind of community, like genuine conversation, artist to artist, where we're actually talking to one another about real ideas, not the kind of bullshit that happens at openings, where it's like, hey, where have you been? Oh, I've been traveling to Italy, or hey, I got an award, or hey, you got a review, or hey, I sold some paintings. Like that's all fine. But I see that as being like secondary or tertiary to what we do as a core, which is produce work. Okay, we produce work mainly for ourselves and mainly for the people that are sitting on the left and right sides of you. If it gets picked up by curators or writers or gets codified in art history or collected or ends up in institutions, that's secondary to me. Um, so uh, around early 2003, um, my wife and I decided to take matters into our own hands. Um, and we decided to kind of create sort of an alternative to this. Um, the better word for this might be an antidote to this. Um, alternative meaning just one more of many, an antidote meaning an actual solution. Um, but we wanted um, what was lacking, which was kind of meaning. Uh, we wanted a conversation among artists. We wanted to present a kind of work that was kind of half understood and half not understood. Like right now, there's a million abstract paintings on the Lower East Side. In 2003, there were none. There was no Lower East Side whatsoever. There was no abstraction being seen at all. There was very little painting being seen at all. A lot of it was identity politic work, performance work, computer work, a lot of work from Cuba, a lot of work from the Middle East, all of which is great. No question there. Um, but it wasn't anything that I was particularly focused on or interested in. 
Um, so we decided to start this thing called Minus Space. And it was literally without space. It was an online project. Uh, in 2003, this is going to seem like ancient history to you guys. <laughs> this is 12 years ago, and the internet is like 10,000 years old at this point. 2003, like the art world was not online. Does anyone remember this? Yeah? yeah? OK. Like the art world was a very suspicious, crazy place. It was filled with pirates and thieves and weirdos. Like you didn't go there to do serious things as an artist. Most arts organizations did not have websites. If they did, they had a one-page brochure at best. Museums, nonprofits, funders were definitely not there. And artists were not online at that point. They did not have websites. And I know I'm going to be teaching about web presence later, uh, later this year with you guys, with some of you at least. Um, but at this time, it, was, it, it like didn't exist. And within that, I, we found great opportunity. So we decided to put up a project um, that was more or less what we would call now a social network. You guys heard this term before? Yes? OK, good. So we built profile pages for artists. Uh, we started kind of locally um, with Brooklyn, with people we've been showing with. Um, included some people I worked with at Pratt as a student, faculty. Some other artists that had graduated from Pratt. Um, we built profile pages. This just seems so lame at this point, I know. But like at the time, this was, I had to literally hand whittle this thing with a knife. I mean, to build a website in 2003 took 80 grand and six to 12 months and a huge staff of people. Because I know I had done it at the New York Foundation for the Arts. So in order to do this project, I had to do it myself. So I taught myself how to do HTML coding, yes. Not because I needed it in my studio, but because this needed it. So built a website, invited artists to participate. Uh, I'll tell you about the focus specifically in a second. Um, but built like profile pages. We presented artists' work, what they wrote about their work, texts about their work, uh, what they were involved in, if they were involved in exhibitions. We put up something called a log at the time a blog now. This, again, this is like defining language. Like This didn't exist. So um, a log started sort of like, hey, let's post all the stuff that's related to what we're interested in, the thing, same thing you guys do on like Instagram constantly. Um, we started curating exhibitions online. This is still not happening right now. Um, and we tried to like take this space and to do as much as we possibly could with it. We did a lot of art historical research. Uh, we posted chronologies about the development of things that I've already talked to you guys about, like um, what is the development of reductive abstraction look like? And I'll talk about that in a sec. Um, and put that up there, and then kind of launched it. And um, we didn't really know what to expect, but it was very interesting. It went around the globe and back very, very quickly. Uh, it happened within a matter of a month. We had a lot of people that stepped forward from First from the United States, then from Europe, and then from South America, and then from you know, Australia, for instance, and said, hey, I'm an artist, and I am experiencing kind of what you're experiencing, which is kind of a lack of meaning, kind of a lack of discourse. I'm the anomaly in my community. You know, There's like one of everything, and I'm this strange guy that makes blue paintings, right? Or I'm doing like performance about the color yellow, this kind of a thing. Can I join it? And we're like, mm, I guess so. I mean, why not? You know, so we started bringing on more and more and more people uh, to the point where we had no longer capacity to bring on more people, um, and ran this online project. Um, now, we organized it around, we knew language was a problem in terms of how we talk about our work, how I talk about my work, how people talk about my work. For instance, I mentioned a couple of New York Times reviews. In each of those Times reviews, they called my work minimalist, right? Which you could say, sure, it's minimalist, but not if you know minimalism, actually. Like, if you know minimalism, you know it was a movement in the early 1960s. It happened in Soho. It was primarily male, and it was primarily a sculpture movement. I'm talking about artists like Donald Judd, Dan Flavin, Carl Andre, Sol LeWitt, and many, many others. Um, and it was really about making objects that referred to nothing outside of themselves. These were as real objects as you are. Thus, the untitled. We don't title things that are real. I don't title this chair. It is a chair, right? Um, so these concerns are part of my lineage, are part of our lineage, but are not my concerns. I am a completely different context, 
completely different generation, working in a different medium, et cetera. So we knew language was a really um, uh, problematic issue. And I should change the slide so I don't bore you guys. Uh, this is the slide of our homepage, which is probably the sixth iteration of our website. We still have a web presence. Uh, we have converted it slowly over into a, kind of a gallery website. Uh, current exhibitions, news, which was our blog, future and past. Current exhibition is Gabriella Everts. It's open until Saturday. She's sitting in the second row. I hope you'll come. Gabriella's, Gabriella's clearly been there. I hope the rest of you guys have come. Um, so we knew language was a problem. Uh, so we, uh, at the time, try to come up with new language to describe what this is. Uh, we literally sat down in front of Google and Googled different terms to call this thing, terms that had no baggage. Uh, and some of those terms that have baggage include minimalism, post-minimalism, neo-geo, constructivist, concrete, neo-concrete, distill, suprematist. I mean, it goes on and on and on. Non-objective. Do you guys know any of these terms? These are all terms that have a place and time and a group and a moment. But they're not the moment that we were involved in in 2003. So um, we decided to Google this term. It yielded zero, zero results on Google. Zero. And uh, we grabbed it. And we defined it in a very specific way. Now, this is very much unlike the term minimalism, which is very much a definition. We kind of think of this as like an operating principle or a strategy. So it's characterized by plain spoken materials, monochromatic limited color, geometric pattern, repetition, seriality. There tends to be a, an intellectual rigor to it, and craftsmanship tends to be a, a major concern. Again, these are big bucket general categories. This um, language that you see up here, we haven't changed in 13 years. This is literally the language we wrote in our living room as we were keying this into HTML code on the site. Um, secondly, and very unusually, I guess, in retrospect, um, we wanted this thing that we were starting to be as inclusive as possible and to be pluralistic. What do I mean by that? We wanted to include multiple geographic locations, multiple age ranges, all gender groups, all media, not painting, not sculpture, sculpture, but all the way through abstract film and performance. Um, artistic strategy, meaning how you made your work and what your work was about. Okay? And it is totally fine for work of artists that we work with to contradict each other. So the blue square painter in New York who's 78 years old and male may contradict directly the Latina filmmaker who's making blue squares in Miami. Okay, and that's okay. Okay, so this idea of being kind of as open-ended as possible. Again, think of this as being um, a, an inch wide but a mile deep. Okay, and we have not reached the bottom of the mine yet. Okay, still after all this time. So this is language we put up there. Uh, this is what Google returned just a couple of days ago. So that's a big difference, bless you. Okay, so this is language that is like by us, for us. Um, oftentimes language is sort of put upon artists, right, by theorists, by writers, by philosophers, by the market. Uh, this is not that. This is not zombie formalism, okay, which is derogatory and done by an artist writer. It's okay. Um, moving on. So again, so there's this whole thing, right, and here we are. Um, we ran this project uh, from 2003 to 2006 as an online project only. Something happened around 2006, uh, which I can only describe as kind of like Pinocchio becoming a real boy, okay, both with our project but also people's comfort level with the internet, I think, bandwidth. You know, you guys remember, you guys, do you even remember like having to get online where we go, do you guys remember this? When it was so horrible and so slow. So something happened around 2006 where there was kind of a critical mass online, the technology was meeting it, it was pretty quick internet speed where, and again, where we were in the development of our project, um, where we started getting emails from people, super simple, that said, hey, I'm coming to New York from, I don't know, Houston. Uh, I want to uh, visit your gallery space, but I can't find your address on your website. <laughs> right? Very simple question. We're like, eh, what are you talking about? We are an online project. I write them back. And uh, I'd be happy to get a cup of coffee with you, but there's no space. It doesn't exist. And then I get another email like that, and another email, and another email, and another email, literally about 50 or 60 emails over the course of about four months in 2006 from all over the place. And then we thought, well, maybe we should actually open up a space. 
You know, maybe we should do a project space. Maybe we should, clearly there's a demand. You know, most galleries open and then think, you know, hopefully people will come. We open our doors and they'll come. Ours was the opposite of this. Ours was like, okay, so we have this audience, which is primarily artists, but also extended to curators and writers and even press people and collectors and art historians and even like the general public that was just interested in this stuff. So it grew from being one thing into something else. And we thought, well, why don't we open a project space? And all of me, I mean, there's many people that have been to our project space, which was we took our studio, which was in Gowanus at the time, which was the frontier of the art world. Now it's like dead center of everything and just lopped off half of our studio and like, now we have a project space. And let's do an exhibition of the people we know, the people we've been working with. And we started doing four shows a year in that project space uh, where we invited artists that we had you know, online presence with to do something they'd never done before. It was that simple. So we had performances, we had shows of new work, we had shows of work that were made in the Gowanus, for the Gowanus, kind of this thing. And we operated like that for a number of years, okay? We had very limited hours. Shows would be up for a day, like a pop-up. Two days, maybe a couple of weeks, tops. The shows closed, we'd turn that part of our studio back over into a studio again. Uh, around the same time in 2006, we started getting invited to do shows elsewhere. Like, hey, I am uh, running a university gallery. Do you want to come to my university gallery and do a minus space show, right? And I would say, well, sure, that's really great, but what does that mean exactly? I don't know what a minus space show is. And that's where curating entered the picture. I'm not a curator, I'm not trained to curate, um, but that's where organizing shows entered the picture because it needed to happen. In the same way, I'm not a web developer. It needed to happen, okay? So we would do a show here, we would do a show at a university gallery, or a nonprofit space, or a commercial gallery, or even a museum. And that continues to today, actually. We still get invited about once a year to come and do a minus space show somewhere. Um, 2009, my son was born. Here he is. This is us goofing around. This is my wife and son in Mexico. We were in Oaxaca, Mexico for a project we did a couple of years ago. And this is him and me goofing around in front of the Whitney Biennial sign, which was down the street from our apartment on the Gold Coast, right? Um, he's a huge part of all of this. When he was born, this is six months, four months after the economy imploded. You guys remember this? Everything kind of fell apart. We're still recovering from this. Uh, he was born and I made the wise and totally insane decision to quit my job for some reason. I wanted to spend more time with him. I wanted to be present. I grew up without a dad around, so I wanted to be like there. And I felt like, you know, I got to be there full time and I can't go back to doing what I was doing prior. So I dove in headfirst into the gallery and had been running it ever since as a, again, big air quotes, full time project. Okay, so I put him up there as being kind of a really clear markation in my life as a line in the sand um, and to show that it is possible to have children in New York City and be an artist and run a space and many, many other things. It is impossibly hard, but amazing. Okay, moving on. Oh, here's he, here he is right here. Actually, at Gabriella's opening. This is him six years later. Uh, we have a whole gaggle of kids. They're kind of like a gang at this point that are all occupying. He's been to every opening we've ever done. He's been to every show we've ever done. And they kind of entertain themselves now. So these are the kids of like many of the artists that we work with and they get like the drawing thing going in my office during our openings, okay? But again, he's surrounded by people like Robert Swain, Gabriella Everts, Vincent Como, Victoria Monroe, and uh, my wife. And these are the children of artists. So artists do have families in New York City. Um, I mentioned uh, a gallery space. So in 2009, I dove into running a space. So I took that half of our studio and ran it like a full-time job, okay? Um, we started doing exhibitions, we started developing a program, we started working more directly with specific artists. Uh, and four iterations of spaces later, we opened this space in Dumbo, Brooklyn uh, in May. And this is on the corner of Main Street and Water. This is the Brooklyn Bridge behind us and the Manhattan Bridge is right over here. So I don't know if you guys know this space. You know Galapagos, you guys know that? So we're in the Galapagos space that they vacated. So we're on this like main corner. How we got to running a gallery space is an enigma to me. I mean, honestly, I never sort of saw myself as being a dealer. Uh, I still don't. I run this like an artist and we um, do have clients that buy work, that keep the doors open, okay? Uh, so this is our new space. Um, I wanna talk just for a second about the exhibitions that we do. Uh, again, very much in the sort of like the, the mission of what we do I showed earlier. In the language, um, we do shows that kind of fall into five categories. 
uh, pioneering emerging artists. Um, emerging in this case does not mean young. Emerging may be 40. Emerging may be 60. Okay, but this equation of like emerging artist and being 20 is not how I see it. And in fact, I don't work with a lot of artists under the age of 30 because it takes a long time to get to the point where you're contributing specifically to our, our bubble, our discourse. Okay. Uh, second, establish and overlooked older artists working in the United States. May have had a career in the market at one point, a big career, maybe during the 60s and 70s, but may have moved by the wayside a bit. Um, but again, they've got uh, kind of a big influence on their community. Maybe they're teaching, maybe they're curating, maybe they're writing. These tend to be kind of artist artists. And by older, the oldest artist we've ever shown is 90. Okay. Uh, and to mix emerging and older and have that full spectrum represented in a gallery space is unusual, you guys. Their galleries are specialized in emerging people, and then there's blue chip, right? But to show kind of like the whole spectrum at the same time and under the same roof is unusual that I've come to understand. Established international artists that have never or rarely shown in the United States. Um, that is many, many, many people you can imagine. Um, so we work with artists in Europe, South America, Asia. We do historical exhibitions that re-examine re underknown or deceased artists. These are maybe artists that um, you know really, really well in a way that you don't know them, right? Or artists you should know. We do a lot of artists that you should know shows. Um, and then lastly, we'll do experimental exhibitions, things that are involving ideas or ephemera, things that are like not art-based. And I'm going to show you just a couple of examples of each of these. And I'm running way out of overtime, so I apologies, apologize, you guys. Robert Swain, this is a show we opened our new space with. He is a color painter active in New York City from the mid-1960s forward. Okay, a show called Color Energy. Another example of uh, a show we've done recently, Roberta Allen, works from the mid-1970s. Actually, they went from the late 60s into the 70s. Uh, she is a, known as a writer. She's been primarily writing for the last 30 years, but during the 60s and 70s, she was very active in the visual arts scene. Is a proto, how do you describe it? She was the only woman represented by John Weber Gallery, which was the minimalist gallery in Soho, New York. Okay, she was an exception to his program. He supported her work though very much. So she did a lot of uh, photographs of herself performing in photo booths with props that she then drew and wrote over. This work um, hasn't been seen in 40 years since she made it. It's been sitting in a drawer that I found as an archaeologist when I went over to her studio. Okay. Hartmut Böhm is a German artist. He's in his mid to late 70s. Seminal, don't like that word so much, but a seminal figure in um, geometric abstraction in Europe was part of very early shows in the late 1950s and early 60s called New Tendency, which was about this kind of discourse, but there. Um, this is a show we did surveying his wall works last year. This was the second solo show he's ever had in the United States. He is extremely well known in his own country. He's in like 300 museum collections. This was the second show in the US. The first show in the US was with us as well. Okay, so just keep that in mind. Like these are people where they are legendary landmark people. Uh, Ward Jackson, another artist, um, works from the early 1960s, color, hard edge painting, was in all the very early, early minimalism show, shows, but his work was about something else. It was about spiritualism, it was about Eastern philosophy, and he kind of got moved off to the side of the main conversation. Didn't stop making work. He actually worked at the Guggenheim for 40 years, founded the magazine The Gallery Guide, and many, many other things. This is a show of Joseph Albers. Uh, does this look familiar to anybody? No, right? So um, I had heard Joseph Albers made some record covers. And I'd heard it from enough people. I thought, well, let's take a look at this thing. So we did the first exhaustive exhibition about Joseph Albers' record covers that he designed for Command Records during the late 1950s and early 60s. Albers is someone that's really important to me. Um, Annie Albers is also really important to me. In fact, she'll be in our next show. I received delivery of her work today at the gallery. So these are like very amazing things for me personally. Um, you guys may not recognize these images, right? I saw them as an art history student too, but I started asking the question, well, what did Life Magazine actually do 
regarding the development of abstraction, the development of modernism in this country, and they did actually a lot. We did the first show of Life magazine's coverage of con like modern into contemporary art between 1936 and 1972. This is the big one they did on Pollock. You guys all recognize the Irascibles photos, yes? So this is an interesting thing. This is um, Life magazine, to put it like really bluntly, was the Google of the day. Right? This is the most widely read, widely circulated thing in this country. And um, this was the story that it told to the people in this country, which I see walking into my gallery every single day and saying, eh, my kids could do that. Right? Where does that question come from? It comes from their very aggressive coverage of the development of modernism, which set the tone for that in this country. Lynn Harlow. One of our emerging artists, uh, this is a sound performance she did called Against the Velvet of the Long Goodbye, uh, where anyone could come into the gallery and jam out on that guitar in this kind of colored light show. She does installation performance work. Group shows, this is a show about artists that are making work about other artists. Okay, that included a lot of people that I really admire, from David Diao, who I already mentioned, Mary Beth Adelson, founder of feminism, Alfred Jensen, who I wrote my graduate thesis on. You guys are following me here, right? This is like a big snake eating its tail. You got it, right? George McCunis, the founder of Fluxus. Lauren Monk, you guys know from his video, hopefully, James Calm Report. Does anybody watch that? Yeah? Video, so that's Lauren. This is his painting. Uh, Ward Shelley and uh, John Zinzer, who also do work about other artists. So what do artists think about their own communities? Uh, this is a show we did about another gallery called Julian Preto Gallery. Julian Preto Gallery existed in New York City between 1975 and the mid-1990s. He died of AIDS at age 50 in 1995 and was really kind of the standard bearer for what we do when it went really underground. Okay, so like the work you make kind of comes above ground and it bubbles up and then it bubbles back down and it bubbles up depending on moods and this state of the market. So this show actually had 45 artists in it, um, each with one work apiece. And uh, all of the work, save a handful of pieces, uh, were shown by Julian Preto on his own gallery walls. So that was a tough one to track down. So it included everything from, who should I say, from like Roberta Allen, which is where I met her to begin with, to Phil Sims, Rosemarie Costoro, who just died uh, a few months ago, um, Olivier Mosse, Sol LeWitt, Christianakos, Carl Andre, and many, many, many others, but under this guise of some other gallery. So it's interesting to me to present another gallery in my own gallery, right? Um, we continue to do shows elsewhere. This is the other part of the show we did at the Southern Oregon University, Schneider Museum. This was a show called, oh, Breaking Pattern. Um, again, seven artists, multiple generations, um, from 40, no, Brian Pori's in his late 30s to about 70 years old. Artists working across the country, men and women equally represented, about artists who are continuing the legacy of op abstraction or pattern-based abstraction. Um, and again, this being the 50th anniversary of the big show at the Museum of Modern Art called The Responsive Eye. Work on the left is Gilbert Shaw. The work on the right is Gabriella Everts. Um, we are very lucky to do projects with other places like private collections. Does anyone know the, the Cisneros collection? Major collection of, thank you, Mark. Uh, major collection of Latin American art. They have deep, deep, deep holdings in Latin American abstraction. And they usually do these big, big shows at places like MoMA or the Tate or the Reina Sofia. And they only ever get to show aspects of their collection. So believe it or not, they approached us to come in and to curate something from their collection from the perspective of artists. And we focused on artists who never see the light of day in their collection, but that are really interesting. So there's the work of about 17 different people here, ranging from the 1930s through the 1970s, including some crazy kinetic vibrating stuff. Uh, we put together a show in Oaxaca, Mexico. I showed you the pyramid photograph. Um, a couple of years ago, we had this invitation um, to put together, again, a minus space show across five museums in Oaxaca, Mexico at the same time. We did four big site-specific projects at a very big group show. This is what these look like right now, some of the artists that we work with. Prior to that, we, got, we did a show at PS1, curated by Fong Bui, who invited us. He was a curatorial advisor there to come to PS1 and to 
do a show. And this was kind of like the biggest show we've ever done up until this point, really up until now. Um, this had 54 artists from 14 countries in it. We had no budget to do this. This was like Herculean, but essentially this was a big download into real space of all the people we had been working with online over all those years. Uh, and really the first time that many of them had shown together. So this is another view that we had multiple spaces in the museum. Um, but again, painting, light work, sculpture, performance, installation, wall paintings, we had kind of everything. Um, questions? <laughs> Sorry to talk your ear off. Yes. A lot of the work that you've shown resembles itself not at the uh, meaning, but as it looks. Mm -hmm. And you said that you don't mind showing two different blue squares that reject one another in yep. terms of subject. Yes. Do you, do you, would you show stuff that doesn't look the same, but it has the same subject, meaning a figurative artist that would talk about abstraction, but in a figurative way? Yeah, it's a good question. So again, I, I've curated a lot of shows. And I've been in a lot of shows that have been curated as an artist as well. And curators tend to, to flatten it. They tend to match socks, right? So it's like I'm going to match all the blue socks and put them together in a show, or I'm going to match all the socks that are striped and put them together in a show, which is what we do around a certain kind of a thesis or a treatise or a conceit. Um, I haven't done a show where I have juxtaposed works that resemble each other but that are divergent conceptually or contextually yet. It's not off the table. Um, but I tend to show works that tend to be, I don't know, I guess my core concerns are doing show, when I put together a group show to make it uh, multi-generational, always, to make it represent men and women equally and to be as divergent as possible in terms of strategy. I mean, that's kind of where I, those are sort of like working MOs for me personally. Um, but again, it's not off the table. I don't know if that answered that question. No. Any other questions? Yes? Um, what would you say about definitions changing with context? Yes, definitions changing with context. Um, for sure, I mean, if you look historically, like each of those groups that I've mentioned over time have kind of had a moment and a number of I don't know, protagonists, if you want to describe it that way. Some that have been remembered and many, if not most, that have not. Um, very few of them have written language about their own moment. It tends to be written for them, which may or may not overlap with what they were actually thinking. Um, so when you read those texts or you read those descriptions or they read the reviews of shows, you have to be very cautious about who the writer is and where they're coming from and how they are related to that thing. Are they writing about it from the first person or are they writing about it from the third person? Are they alive at that moment? Are they writing about something that happened before? Um, when are they writing about it? Are they writing about it in real time? Or they're writing about it in retrospect? Are they writing about it um, agnostically from the market, which is traditionally written by the winners, the big sellers, right? Are they objective, in other words? Or are they kind of towing the party line? OK, so there's a lot of things you need to be careful of when you're reading. Um, did that answer that question? Because I went I, off on a tangent, yeah. I was thinking about like Wikipedia's definition of uh, like an art topic, any, and mm -hmm. like Janssen's definition, it's like right. very different, but both are e like equally pertinent, so. Yeah, I mean, and you guys are growing up in the internet age, and you've probably been raised by the internet uh, at this point. I know our son is. So um, that was meant to be a joke. Um, the, yes, I mean, there are things that you need to learn, and you will learn. And uh, you should be questioning them. Again, this is coming from me, liberal arts background as an undergraduate. You should be questioning everything that you're learning constantly, not take it at face value. Um, so I would hope you're all doing the exact same thing here, 
which is where you're learning, 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 and asking, well, why? My son does this every five seconds. Why? I don't understand. Why? 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 You know, it's like, why? But that's a Socratic method. I mean, like, why? And I hope that you're questioning all of those things. For instance, much of what I just talked about related to our gallery space and the context is not stuff that I learned in books. It is learned by going to studios, which is a whole other narrative. Like, we've crafted this entire thing by communicating directly with other artists. It's not by reading history books. It's not by... Uh, taking the advice of curators or collectors who are also very well informed, but by really looking at uh, what artists say and who artists feel are important to the overall discourse. So again, I tend to err on the side of like artist artists in a way. Um, and again, whether an artist has had success in the market in any way, shape, or form, press, sales, general recognition is irrelevant to what we do at the gallery. It is noise to me. Yeah. We maybe have time for one more question. All right, great. Thanks, guys. Can you talk <clears throat> a little bit about how you ended up opening up that gallery space and you know, like the funding and all the stuff that went into developing that? Because it's, it's really interesting that you're in the Galapagos art space now because like they left and went to Detroit for financial reasons and all this other stuff. So could you just talk about that a little bit? Sure. Um, Yes, it appears that this came out of magic, right? Like out of like nowhere. And again, this flattened half an hour version actually took place over a lot of hand wringing over 12 years. You're getting the short of it, the very, very short of it. Um, it was extremely hard work. And it wasn't hard work for one day and then we stopped or two days and then we stopped. It was very hard work over a long period of time. Um, I used to swim competitively. This may seem irrelevant. Uh, I still swim. Um, in, I used to swim long distance swimming. And you know, you, if you swam 10 miles in one day and then race the next, it's not going to do you much good. But we would train every single day, hour, 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 hour. And then over time, you'd build up endurance. And over time, you would find yourself way further away from where you used to be as an athlete, as a competitor. And um, we kind of run this project at the very beginning. We ran it thinking, okay, so we're going to put in, what would happen if we put in five minutes a day into it? Is that going to put us five minutes further where we want to go, right? Or what if we put an hour in a day? Or what if we put two hours in? Or what if we work on it seven days a week? A couple of minutes a day. But like thinking incrementally, not thinking like all at once, right, is sort of the strategy that we adopted. Um, Again, sort of moving back just a bit, like thinking philosophically of this, you know, we were kind of at a point A, right? And we're artists. We think creatively. We can envision and know where we want to go. We set goals with our work, with our careers. We want to get to that like point B, right? So we could kind of see we're in point A. We don't love it. We can kind of feel the symptoms of point A. But in our now, like in retrospect, like point B didn't really exist. Okay, we had to make point B. And you guys, I'm going to encourage you to make point B in a big way. Like it's not just getting from A to B. You have to make point B, and you guys are extremely creative. So that point B is going to be different for all of you. You're going to be addressing like where you want to go, what your community of artists needs, you know, what what needs to happen. And I hope that you use this as an example, but not repeat it, because we made like every conceivable error as we did this project. I mean everything. You name it, we did it. Um, it never became anything more than ones and zeros, ether. It didn't exist until we opened up a bricks and mortar space. It's not to say that it didn't cost money to do it, but doing a website was website hosting, email list service, some HTML stuff. Um, again, very low cost. And at this point, you guys can put up a website if you were to do something like this basically for free and in five minutes. Right? It's click, 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 and you've got like a Tumblr site up. Okay? Um, our, so, so, so financially, at that time when we started the project, it was negligible. Time, however, not negligible. You know, money is renewable. Right? You can always find more money somehow. You work, you wait tables, you work a job, do construction, whatever you want to do. Time, you don't get back. 
And we felt like putting our time into this project was the best use possible, okay? And as the project grew, we ended up putting more and more and more time into it, okay? And what did that mean in terms of our studio practice? So if we're working all this extra time on this project, we're not spending it in the studio, right? And that would seem like a horrible story to most of you guys. Like, oh my god, I want to spend as much time in my studio as humanly possible. Like, this sounds terrible. Why would you do this? Um, but what we realized is that we were creating a context for our work to go into that was much more sort of robust. We built an ecology for the work to exist in that didn't exist. Again, that point B. So now, yes, we spend less time in the studio, but I've never been busier with my studio work as a result. So think about, like, you know, if you put yourself out there in all these different ways, it ends up in a weird way coming back to you in a way you never anticipated. Now, um, money never entered the equation until we opened a bricks and mortar space. At first, it was very minimal, uh, meaning we just were continuing to pay our studio rent. Um, but as we have grown, with every successive step, there has been a bigger and bigger and bigger sum of money that we need to come, kind of come up with at the end of each month. Um, we run a project. Uh, the goals with, with this gallery have always been to be, um, to be totally uncompromised, meaning we show what we want to show, no matter what, and to be self-sustaining, which means that this project will sustain itself financially. Okay, so we have been able to maneuver this project forward over many, many, many years incrementally. I mean, these are baby steps, baby steps, baby steps to where we have this crazy space in Dumbo now. Okay, this was never an intention though. This kind of was sort of planning and circumstance in a way. So our overhead, yes, is bigger than it's ever been, but so is the revenue as a result of that is bigger than it's ever been. And there's a lot of talk about galleries right now closing up and joining forces and trying to compete and art fairs and blah, blah, blah. And we could talk about that ad nauseum, honestly. I have a lot of opinions about that, but we, um, we kind of drown that out and sort of beat to our own drummer. So financially, the gallery pays for itself. Um, it, on, in a good year, will pay for part of B as well, right? And each of you is going to have to figure out, if you haven't done already, what your personal budget is going to look like, meaning how much money do you need to do what you need to do. In some cases, that may be 20 grand a year. And in some cases, it might be 120 grand a year. Whatever that amount is, is totally personal to you. It does not matter to me or to anyone else how much money you need to survive and to thrive, OK? Um, so part of my income comes from my studio work. Part of my income will now come from teaching, as it has, from consulting, and from other things. Um, but generally speaking, the gallery does pay for me a bit. Like There was a moment there a few years ago where I had a conversation with the gallery. And I said, gallery, you're going to pay for my health insurance. And the gallery said, OK. <laughs> and that's that. So again, these are, these are things. But again, my overhead now is bigger than it's ever been. But it is being, I don't know, evened out. If you think of this as like a scale, it's being evened out on the other side with more revenue. Like we're able to do bigger shows with sort of more objects by more people. And again, baby steps up the ladder. You know, we didn't open up a mega gallery and hope people came, right? I am not a person of wealth. I will stress this to you. I am not a person of wealth. I do not have a backer. There is no one supporting the gallery, okay? There's no one paying the bills, okay? We have to be super duper duper frugal and to invest in ways that we feel will take us to the next part. Like, right now I need a sign outside of our gallery building. Like, how are we going to fundraise for that? That's my next thing. Like, how are we going to do that, right? I need to be a little bit more visible on the street. And just taking it incrementally from there. Did that answer that question? OK, so I guess to wrap up, thank you guys for being here. Super excited to be part of the SVA community with you. And um, I would strongly encourage you guys not to wait around to make things happen. The art world is made by us. It did not exist. The art world is not some abstract concept. It is made by us, and it is malleable. And I'm sure at the very beginnings of your careers, you're going to be working very hard to get a seat at the table, which is normal. 
And then after that, I hope you work on kind of making your own table. Right? Thank you, guys. Cool.